Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining today's lunch and learn webinar. Why we chose not to go with calf auto feeders. Featuring Dr. Lee Michaels. I'm Nicole Cass, the CE program manager for the MVMA. And your moderator for today's session. A quick review to help you navigate the webinar functions. And please note that depending on the type of device you're using, you do have the opportunity to minimize various boxes, making the slides larger. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A area at any point during the session. If you're unable to find the Q&A icon, hover your cursor over the bottom of your screen and it should appear for you. I'm delighted to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Lee Michaels. Dr. Michaels is a 2015 University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine graduate. He started in private practice doing solely cattle work in central Minnesota. In 2019, he joined Wholesome Dairies in Hilbert, Wisconsin as their staff veterinarian and dairy manager. Please go ahead, Dr. Michaels. Thank you for the introduction, Nicole. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you everyone, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity from the MVMA to, to give this presentation to you today. Uh, I hope that it provides uh, the listeners with some value in, in the decision process of our farm and, and how we wanted to change our milk fed system. Um, before I get started, I don't know me through the observatory that is the rotary dairy here at rotary parlor here at the Elm dairy. Um, nonetheless, let's get started. So with this presentation, I want to. I want to take you on just a little bit of the journey in the decision making and the process we went through uh, in deciding that we had to leave our old nursery system behind, uh, the choices and decisions we had to make in picking a new system, and then finally the direction we decided to go. Uh, and with this process, everything was on the table um, as far as individually housed, uh, group, group housed, paired, auto feeders. Um, everything was on the table, and, and it's no secret with the title of the presentation, I guess, what we chose not to do. But nonetheless, I mean, auto feeders and the technology uh, they provide is, is becoming more widely adopted throughout the dairy industry, especially in the Midwest. Uh, and, and I think it would have been foolish of us to not consider auto feeders when, when we were going through this decision making process. And with that, I will jump in, but if, if anyone has questions during the presentation, please, please chime in. You do not have to wait to the end. Um, this may be the last presentation I ever uh, volunteer to give if, uh, if I have to talk to my computer for 45 minutes uninterrupted. So please, please chime in. Let's make it more of a discussion than just a lecture. All right, with that, let's jump in. Um, So Nicole did a job introduced me. Yes, 2015 University of Minnesota grad had the opportunity to work in in Central Minnesota, Stearns County with Freeport Veterinary Service. Shout out to Dr. Tom and Dr. Steve if they're listening. Uh, wonderful guys and and wonderful clients there in Central Minnesota. In 2019, I had the opportunity to join Wholesome Dairies as a staff veterinarian. Uh, and I spent time at all three of our sites, our two cow dairies, and then our calf ranch as well. And then since October of last year, I've uh, taken on the, the the position of managing our our elm dairy, which has been exciting and challenging. But I've really really grown to like it. Um, our two our two dairies are located just outside of Hilbert, Wisconsin, just south of Green Bay, uh, here in East Central Wisconsin. Uh, both dairies are, are are quite similar. The Elm Dairy milks about 3,800 cows three times a day, and the Irish Dairy about 3,500 cows three times a day. Uh, both facilities are almost identical in design. Um, very long two row pens, four row barns, naturally ventilated. Uh, the Irish Dairy has a 72 stall rotary, and the Elm Dairy has an 80 stall rotary. Connected to the Elm Dairy, the Elm Dairy is here in this picture. Connected to the Elm Dairy is our calf ranch, um, where, where we raise calves, uh, both from from both of our dairy sites. Uh, once once Springers freshen into our dairy system, they will stay at the Elm Dairy or stay at the Irish Dairy. So all of these barns in this picture are filled with milk cows, uh, soon to be springing heifers or or dry cows. 
So the, the Irish and Elm dairy, we produce approximately 24 calves a day of which 10 are Holstein heifers. Uh, the remainder are an Angus Holstein cross. Uh, we do have uh, calf buyers come and pick up our, our Angus cross calves uh, six days a week, but the, the Holstein heifers are picked up daily from each dairy and transported to the calf ranch, and that, that is what we raise in our nursery. Um, the, the calf ranch at any given time will have approximately 560 calves on milk, uh, with calving slugs, it can certainly go up to 700 calves on milk at any given time, but on average, typically that 550 to 600. In our calf ranch, in, in its entirety, we have day old calves up to nine month old heifers. Uh, and then from that point, we work with four different heifer growers for breeding and growing, uh, and then they return to the dairy uh, just pot prior to freshening. So let's talk about our old nursery system and, and, and the system we were using. Uh, th this nursery barn facility was built uh, approximately 2010, so let's say 11 years ago, um, and is a very unique facility. I, I have seen nothing quite like it in my travels throughout the dairy industry before coming to Wholesome. Um, here's a picture of one of the rooms inside of this overall barn. Uh, you can see the, the metal pens on both the left and the right. These were group pens with approximately eight calves per pen. Uh, they were delivered through a hose and nipple system, an ad lib amount of acidified waste milk. Uh, there were two shared nipples per pen, uh, common, common starter grain trough or barrel. And you can see the metal slatted flooring uh, which the calves lived on, and, and they lived over a, a shallow manure pit. The pit underneath those metal floors was about 18 inches deep or so, um, and filled, filled with water and flushed three times a week. Um, given this facility was, was built with a couple of, of things in mind, one was, was um, not not using bedding to raise milk fed calves and and i will say if if this a facility achieved anything it achieved it achieved that not using bedding uh therefore it also had to be heated uh to keep the calves warm during the winter because they had no ability to nest and preserve their own heat um if this barn most most reminds me of a finishing hog barn right where it's uh, animals are living over a slatted floor and manure pit it is negatively ventilated all mechanically ventilated but a negative pressure system the ceiling inlets and exhaust fans on that far wall if you can see them in the picture uh run entirely on static static pressure and temperature uh to control the ventilation system um again very much in my mind like like most modern day confinement hog facilities uh, but these, the, this facility posed challenges that we felt we could not, we could not overcome and, and achieve our goals with raising milk fed calves. Uh, and, and it pushed us to the point where, where we knew we had to do something different. Look, I'm going to jump into and talk about the results that we had in our old facility. And by no means is this bragging, it's just, just being frank and honest. Uh, brutally honest about about our experience in this facility. Um, uh, relatively significant amount of scours, right? Our normal scour pathogens, rotavirus and coronavirus mainly. Um, even though it was a, a, a steel and concrete uh, facility, I, I still felt it was really challenging to disinfect it uh, well. Um, just given given the nature of, of, of how it was made and common common airspace in the attic between these multiple rooms, I think there were just a variety of factors that made it really difficult to to sanitize well, especially as the building aged and metal got rusty, etc. Uh, so scours was a big concern and big problem. Apple mesal bloats and ulcers. Again, we fed we fed a acidified milk ration to these calves. Um, not a ton of acidified milk being fed to calves here in the Midwest that I'm aware of, uh, right? The goal, the goal of this is to chemically, chemically pasteurize or sanitize the milk product and, and allow it to be preserved, chemically preserved for the calf. Uh, in theory, it should, should be relatively um, easy to manage, 
easy from a labor standpoint, um, clean, right, in, in theory. Um, but I, I think it broke down in our hands. I think it broke down for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, the calves, the, the milk that the calves consumed uh, was, was cold by my standards, certainly not anywhere near body temperature by the time it flowed through all the piping and hosing and nipples and actually got to the calf. Uh, I, I think that, that although you could not culture any bacteria growing in this preserved milk, uh, it, it should come to no surprise to any of us that if if you start with a marginal milk product to begin with, and just because you add formic acid to preserve it, doesn't magically clean it. I mean, if anything, you just release a bunch of endotoxin into the waste milk that we were feeding these calves. Uh, so I think cleanliness, temperature, cleanliness was was a huge issue that that led to abomasal bloats and ulcers, and also hunger. Uh, if any of you have ever tasted acidified milk it tastes terrible um it's bitter uh and when when we would try to train calves or or, or encourage sick calves to to drink acidified milk uh you you could clearly see that it wasn't their preference um so i mean i think a combination of, of cleanliness temperature and hunger certainly led to the number of abomasal bloats and ulcers that we would see Respiratory disease was another really large challenge. Again, thinking back to that picture on the previous slide with the ceiling inlets um, and calves living over shallow, shallow lagoons of, of urine and, and feces. Um, you know, when we would when we would bring fresh air into the room, uh, I don't I don't believe it was very it was fresh for very long. I mean, the amount of ammonia in these rooms was considerable. Uh, and, and the way that this facility was constructed, there was not, not an option for pit fans to be installed. So you could not get a unidirectional airflow, uh, you know, down past the calf and going out past the manure. Uh, it, the, the fresh air came down, went to the calf, went through the slats, hit the lagoon and came right back up into the calf environment. And these calves lived their entire life within three feet of, of a manure lagoon or over a manure lagoon. I think that's that's a really challenging environment to succeed from a respiratory health standpoint. And then moving on to, to cross sucking. Um, if, if someone wanted to make a perfect facility to encourage calves to cross suck on each other, I, I think we did it. Uh, I think raising calves in groups, feeding them something they don't want to eat, uh, constantly being hungry, um, unable to wean them appropriately onto grain, you know, with no meaningful way to scale back the amount of milk they were taking in, uh, I, I think led to, to a perfect cross-sucking uh, environment. And then, of course, this all translates into really poor average daily gains. Um, Again, not a surprise and nothing I'm bragging about. I'm just being frank and honest and and, and trying to share with you where we were at and 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 at some point we knew we had to make a change to to achieve our goals. Um, calves, you know, both both from a from the consumption of milk standpoint and and then getting them through through the transitioning transition of the weaning process and having what I felt was pretty little control over driving starter grain intake. Uh, really, really challenged growth, growth in this facility and, and, and just after. And of course, this led to excessive morbidity, mortality, uh, and, and then labor inefficiency and compassion fatigue. Um, you know, what, what was designed in theory, you know, 11, 12 years ago to, to be a labor of labor efficient uh, barn really turned into the opposite, treating sick calves. Uh, consumes a lot of time, and also for 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 the people we're asking to do that, there there's a fair amount of compassion fatigue that takes place. You know, as a veterinarian, I can think of few few things worse than spending my day all day treating sick calves, um, and, and how excited I would be to come to work and do it again the next day. That that would be really challenging, and, and it certainly was for our staff, uh, who are who are great people. Um, but wow, did we ask them to do something that that was not very friendly. And lastly, I'll, I'll comment on this old this old facility is it, it was not compliant with the farm program. Uh, the farm program requires that calves have a soft area to lay down. 
Um, there was nothing soft about these group pens, right? Living on these metal slatted floors was not soft. Uh, and, and complying with the farm program is, is important to us and, and, and ensuring animal welfare is important to us. And this facility did not achieve those things. Dr. Michaels, we have a couple of questions. Awesome. What pH did you shoot for for the acidified milk? Yeah, drop the pH. Um, we use formic acid as, as the acid of our choice to drop the pH, and we drop it to approximately 4.1 um, to preserve it. Uh, we, we considered that milk feedable for approximately four days before we would have to dump it. Um, I, I claim to be no expert on acidifying milk, but that was that was our target. Great, thank you. And another question: What was the minimum maximum CFM calf in the old barn barn design, and what was the cubic feet of barn space per calf? Sure. So, I I am unable to answer the first question on CFM per calf. I can give a better estimate on um, cubic feet of airspace per calf. In the old facility, we would keep approximately 200 calves per room, um, and just rough math, we would have been we would have been close to 200 cubic feet per calf. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the recommendation is being 700 cubic feet per calf. Um, you know, and putting you know having stocking density that that puts you under 700 cubic feet per calf is it becomes increasingly challenging, if not impossible. And, and clearly at 200, we had well exceeded that, that guideline or bench, benchmark um, in, in our old facility with, with how, we were, how we were choosing to operate it. Thank you. So with that, right again, sharing where we were, the results that we had, we knew, we knew we were, we knew it was time we were ready to, to make a change. And, and so planning for the new nursery, right? And, and our goal, our goal in, in, in this planning was to raise healthy milk fed calves in a simple labor efficient and cost effective manner. Uh, that, that was our goal and, and everything was on the table and, and we had a lot of choices to make, um, you know, milk replacer versus waste milk, drive by feeding versus auto feeder. If we do drive by feeding, is it gonna be a bottle or a bucket? How are we going to house these animals? Single, pair, group? Uh, are we going to do an outdoor hutch? Are we going to do some type of indoor facility? And then if we did it indoor, would it be natural or mechanically ventilated? Uh, and, and there's more choices, right? But there's a lot that goes into when you're, when you're starting with a blank slate, there's a lot that goes into how are you going to, you know, what, 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 what choices are you going to make and, and, and how are you going to make this work? Um, and, and so everything truly was on the table. I just wanted to share that picture on the right about choices, right? And, and clearly this, this cow made the choice to get onto our rotary backwards. That was a pretty unique picture. Don't see that too often, thankfully. So let's talk about facility design. I guess from my standpoint, really the meaningful choices that we had uh, were individually housed, group housed, but fed individually, or group housed on an auto feeder. Um, or some combination thereof, right? Um, there, there are a lot of dairies that have auto feeders, grouped auto feeders that start individually housed and then transition into a group group housed auto feeder situation. Um, and, and really any of these are on the table. Um, looking more closely, right? If, if look, looking at building new individually housed, we, we, were, not, we were not open to doing outdoor hutches. Um, from a from a human standpoint, and, and and doing a good job with with calves out in the winter, it was something that we were just not not going to entertain. So we knew pretty early on in our decision process, our calves were going to be under 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 a roof in some type of structure. Uh, more for the people than the calves, but the people are are obviously a critical component to making this whole system work. You know, and if if we were going to build new individual uh, housing, it, it would look similar, right? Maybe a south facing monoslope or a very, very uh, skinny, uh, naturally ventilated type barn. 
you know, with positive pressure tubes or, or some similar type of ventilation system to introduce fresh air into those calf micro environments. Um, but this, this was certainly one of the considerations when we were moving, moving into this process. A different type of housing um, would be group housed, but fed individually. Uh, a little shout out to Dr. Megan Shrupp in central Minnesota. She has a beautiful calf facility, very similar to, to the one in this picture, right? Where she group houses uh, milk fed calves, but then feeds them individually in these bottle headlocks and, and kind of combines, combines, you know, uh, both, right? That individual feeding, but yet that group housing and, and, and obviously there are benefits and cons to, to both and, and, and this somewhat splits it down the middle. Uh, I think it's a really interesting, really interesting design and, and, and I think it has promise. I, I really do. Um, but that was another consideration as we were planning where we wanted to go with with this with this project. And then lastly, uh, group housed auto feeder, right? It's just a generic picture of a pretty typical auto feeder environment for milk fed calves. Um, which I assume most of you are aware have been in these these facilities. Um, you know, typically 20 or so calves per pen. Um, sharing sharing a nipple and and depending on the farm size maybe achieving all in our all out or raising everything from from very young calves up till weaning in these type of group environments um th those were those were our our three initially those were the three choices that we narrowed narrowed down to um then for the purpose of this conversation and presentation today I'm 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 going to focus more on on group auto feeder type barns and and individual type calf milk facilities um, and and thinking back to our goal right our goal was to raise healthy milk fed calves you know in a simple simple labor efficient cost effective manner and so so I'm starting with healthy right the health component of our goal and for me it, it helped to to break this out into to positives and negatives uh, I'm going to start with with negatives and and clearly given the title of the presentation negative list is longer than my positive but when when I think about grouped house calves and and auto feeder calves Negatives that come to mind for me are, are nose to nose contact is, is certainly inevitable and, and expected in these type of facilities and, and, and shared fomites, right? The, the nipple is shared, the water trough is shared, the gates, the walls, everything, right? Everything is, is, is in contact from one calf to another at any time. Um, and, and stepping forward to that next bullet point, and, and contagious disease control in these environments, uh, for me, would certainly be more challenging, uh, just given giving all given all those shared fomites, uh, and and how often can you realistically sanitize? Uh, if, if you have a sick calf that's excreting millions of of rotavirus particles into the environment, um, I think contagious disease control has to come to mind when can. You know, when when wanting to preserve animal health in, in these type of environments, I'll go back to cross sucking. Um, given our history and our previous facility, I think we made the perfect facility to encourage cross sucking. Um, I, I think that you could raise calves in a group or an auto feeder setting and do significantly better than we did in our old facility, of course, uh, but nonetheless. Any time that you pair group calves, cross sucking is a risk. It just will be and always will be. Um, I think there are there are things you can do to minimize it, um, but but it is always a risk. And 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 for a dairy animal that is hopefully going to join the lactating herd, I think it's a serious risk that people have to be aware of. Next, you'll see I have consistency of total solids, uh, and and this is my personal bias. The the only the only data I have to back this up is is doing doing bricks, uh, refractometer total solids estimation you know on farm with my clients when I was in private practice uh, with their auto feeders. But something I found really frustrating with with my clients when I was in practice is when their auto feeder would would auger out milk replacer powder. I I really I, I felt that it was quite clumpy. 
uh, I felt that that the, the variation from one mix to another uh, was there. I don't think it was insignificant. Um, I, I don't know that there is that there is uh, the machines are as consistent at delivering the exact same amount of powder every time as, as maybe they ought to be with with the way that they're designed. Um, and, and I and I think that does play a role in calf health. Um, not having consistent total solids and milk replacer to me is is a big deal. Now maybe maybe new machines or, or new newer variations or certain types of milk replacer that don't cake or pack quite as much uh, can help alleviate that. Um, but but I think it's a concern. Twenty calf per nipple limit. Um, I had a veterinarian tell me once that you will get to 20 calves per nipple one way or another. And, and, and I tend to I tend to very much agree with that statement. I think if you put 25 or 30 calves on one nipple, I think you will get to 20. Uh, in most scenarios, I, I, I think that is a realistic expectation uh, of the number of calves that can nurse from one nipple and live in that group environment. Um, most auto feeders, and, and now talking more specifically about the Forrester Technic, which is the Lely or De Laval, and even the, the Holman Lao, um, most of those machines, especially the Forrester Technics, can only feed one nipple at a time while measuring milk flow. Now, the companies have realized that this is this is a huge detriment and it cuts your feeding time from 24 down to 12. Uh, so there are additional accessories that can be purchased that allow the machine to dispense to both nipples and and record milk flow simultaneously. A lot of my clients in practice did not have that feature. Uh, and, and so really those calves only had 12 hours a day to drink. Uh, and, and the machine would try to pulse back and forth to keep calves on both nipples interested and at the nipple, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think it's a... I think it's a serious limitation of auto feeders or, or something that a person has to be very cognizant of when they're making that choice and making the choice how many calves that they can stock per machine or per nipple. Starter grain consumption. In, in group housing, starter grain consumption, both, both access, how is it delivered? You know, oftentimes it's delivered on the side of the pen through slant bars, and 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 I think that's a mistake. I, I think young milk-fed calves need to have easy access in the pen access to starter grain. Uh, I think having asking them to asking a seven or ten or fourteen-day-old calf to stick its head through slant bars to eat grain, I think, is a relatively unrealistic expectation. And, and and obviously that starter grain, the consumption of starter grain over the milk fed period is really what's going to determine determine room and development. And and I think that's I think that's a challenge. Now obviously you can overcome that by putting starter grain troughs inside the pen or barrels inside of the pen, which which I think is appropriate in a lot of settings. But you never get the information on an individual calf basis on starter grain consumption. Of course you can get it on a on a group basis, uh, but you don't know how individual calves are increasing their starter grain as you're approaching your weaning period. And I, and I do think that's a negative when it comes to health in, in group group environments. Now, I do have to give some positives to to group and auto feeders, right? Socialization would be would be would be one of those. Um, there, there's more and more research showing the positive attributes to socialization in milk fed calves. Although my personal belief is we have a long ways to go uh, to learn how important is socialization. When is it important? Is it important at day one? Is it important at 21 or 50 days of age? When is it important? You know, is pairing enough? Do they need groups larger than pairing? I, I think we have just a, a lot to learn on socializing milk fed calves and, and, and how that determines their, their health and, and productivity uh, as they move through our heifer raising systems. Ability to deliver three plus meals a day, right? Certainly auto feeders are, are well designed and capable of achieving, achieving multiple meals a day, you know, three, four, five, six, seven meals a day, uh, which from a health standpoint, I, I, I really do believe is, is, is a benefit to the calf. And of course, re recording milk, milk consumption, and drinking speed, um, also very, very valuable. Uh, 
if if your auto feeder is is set up to do so. Again, thinking back to the goal, right? The goal was to raise healthy milk fed calves in a simple labor efficient and cost effective manner. So for, for the simple part of our goal, I think these two pictures say it all. Um, the auto feeder versus, versus, you know, feeding out of a bottle or a bucket. I think there's no comparison. Um, now, clearly I'm being a little bit jaded, right? I'm not showing the, you know, we got a mixed milk replacer or pasteurized milk for each of these, right? And I'm not showing that on the bucket side, but buckets or bottles are simple, period. They are. Um, auto feeders just have a lot more parts, a lot more moving parts, um, uh, 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 entirely contained wash system, um, programming, uh, EIDs for the calf to, to get recognized when they come up to eat. Uh, there's a lot that goes into managing an auto feeder, and, and I think they're just two very different systems. For me, the bucket is undoubtedly more simple. Looking at labor efficiency, again, our goal, healthy calves and a simple labor efficient uh, system. You know, so so I broke this down. Let me walk through how I did some of my math here. So, you know, approximately 600 milk fed calves for us at any given time. I attributed 44 labor hours a day to the milk fed calves. Now we have we have six full time people at our calf ranch, but those six full time people take care of everything from day old up to nine month old heifers. Uh, now, un undoubtedly. The milk fed calves consume more of their time. I think I'm probably being a little generous here at 44 hours a day. I, I think it's probably less time that's actually devoted to milk fed calves, but nonetheless, I, I attributed 44 labor hours a day for people 11 hour shifts um, to take care of milk fed calves. That comes out to about 30 minutes per calf per week. And, you know, and in that 30 minutes, right, it's feeding, vaccinating, washing buckets adding new grain, taking old grain away, adding new bedding, dirty bedding, treating, dehorning, washing panels, et cetera, the whole, the whole thing. Um, now, when I, when I look at comparing that to an auto feeder group type system, undoubtedly auto feeders allow a more flexible schedule. Um, you do not have to be there at the same time every day. Uh, where I do firmly believe with individual calves, having having that type of routine is quite important. Uh, auto feeders allow that flexibility. Um, the, by all means, they get they get a hand up in this discussion. I will make an argument that it requires more skilled labor to appropriately manage an auto feeder. Just because of the components that go into it, the wash system that's contained within the program for for feeding the calves and ramping them up using the computer program to to make decisions on which calves am I going to to look at closer that possibly are 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 sick. Um, I, I do think it it takes a little bit more uh, skill to successfully manage an auto feeder and the labor around that I don't think is negligible. You can see I have 30 minutes times 40 calves is 2.85 hours a day, right? So, so I use my math on the right of our current system, let's say 30 minutes per calf, and I times that by 40 calves, assuming one Forrester Technic auto feeder, 20 calves per pen, two nipples, total of 40 calves. So that'd come out to about 2.85 hours a day that a person would have to spend for it to be equivalent, right? If it was going to be equivalent to, an, to our individual system. And in that 2.85 hours a day, right, you'd have to potentially feed young calves, right? Because a lot of auto feeder farms that do so successfully will feed their their calves for five, six, seven days until they're aggressive enough to, to, to be put onto the auto feeder full time. So feeding young calves, let's say twice a day, vaccinating, calibrating the machine, washing and changing nipples, changing hoses, right? Adding grain, taking grain away, bedding, dirty bedding, treating, dehorning, washing panels, walls, etc. Right, all of those things. Uh, it comes out to about 20 hours a week uh, for those 40 calves. I think that auto feeders can. I think you could certainly manage those 40 calves for 20 hours a week. I do think that's possible, or 2.85 hours a day. 
if anything, I think you could certainly do it for less, right? I don't have I don't have the the experience or the comparison in front of me to know what type of labor commitment it would take. Uh, I don't think it would take more, but I do often wonder if you're going to get equal results, how much less time would it really take? I, I'm not sure. Back to our goal of, of raising healthy milk fed calves in a simple labor efficient and cost effective manner. Um, for us, again, if, if we were gonna abandon our old facility and we were gonna build a brand new facilities, whether it be individually housed, whether it be group housed, for us, it would have would have required buying more land. Our, our current dairy site was, was full with buildings and structures and manure pits, so we physically had no space to put new buildings. Um, to buy land from the neighboring farmer uh, that adjoined our calf ranch costs, would have costed us $15,000 an acre. Um, land in this area routinely sells for $10,000 an acre, and he had no incentive to sell it. He didn't want to sell it. Right, so for him to sell it to us, we certainly had to make it worth his time. When we priced out um, engineering new construction, uh, when you look at engineering excavating concrete, the structure, leachate pumps, um, the leachate uh, channels and drains, uh, bringing plumbing and electrical out to this 15 acre parcel, uh, that, that all came to about $4,000 a calf space. And that adds up really fast for for us wanting to have 56 days on milk and 7 days post weaning um, before having to move or add an additional stressor to that calf wanting to do an all in all out type flow. We assumed we'd need approximately 900 calf spaces uh, again that week after that week after weaning. And with all in all out with a little bit of facility downtime, especially during a calving slug where we're having higher numbers of calves uh, comes to about 900 spaces times 4,000 very quickly got to 3.6 million dollars uh, for new facility construction again kind of regardless of whether it was going to be individual or group housed we were going to be in this ballpark um, that was that was hard for us to to swallow looking at those numbers we took a very hard look at our existing nursery, right? And, and, and not, we really did not want to go back into this barn, um, but this still has to cash flow at the end of the day. Uh, we want to achieve our goals, but it also has to be cost effective. So looking at our old nursery, what, what can we do with this facility? You know, right? We have these rooms are approximately 35 feet by 200 feet or 185 feet long, something like that. Um, quite low ceilings, maybe only six and a half, seven feet tall. Um, but what can we do with these facilities? Because this barn is going to be here whether we use it or not. Um, what can we do? So we looked at if we were to convert convert these rooms to have individual calf housing. Um, Right, the, the costs associated with that, obviously labor, um, using you know facilities, we'd use the existing building, but let's say we were gonna buy calf pens, individual calf tail pens. You know, it's approximately $315 a calf space. You know, if you times that by about 88 calves that you can fit in these rooms, 28,000 just in calf tail pens. For feeding equipment, let's assume that we were gonna use a, a Kubota or some other type of delivery vehicle with a tank and a pump you know, a bucket washer, bottle washer, um, you know, for those 88 calves that 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 feeding equipment, that dispensing system is going to come to about four thousand one hundred eighty dollars, you know, so for a total about thirty two thousand to put individual calves in one of these rooms. Now, when we looked at auto feeders, um, we'd have to we'd have to make group pens, you know, that fit fit the ability of the auto feeder to feed, right, which would certainly be plumbing and electrical to the auto feeder room itself where the auto feeder is going to be housed and then concrete in those shallow pits, etc. I'm just putting a ballpark number on that. I, I, I'm assuming about $50,000 a room to concrete, get that electrical, get that plumbing out there, build that little structure where the auto feeder is going to sit, the gates that you would have to do, etc, etc. The auto feeder itself, 
Um, we did price out auto feeders. These were home and law auto feeders. Um, advertised advertised to do about 80 calves per auto feeder. Now this this particular type of auto feeder has two mixing jars. In theory, it's going to feed four nipples. One machine would feed four nipples or four pens. Um, so 80 calves total, right? And then you can get the additional accessories, the the chlorine dioxide spray on the nipple, you know, in between calves, about an eight thousand dollar option. You know, so I'm I'm making an assumption uh, the auto feeder route would have costed approximately $78,000 per room for for 80 calves in this facility. So, the direction we went, we decided we were going to tear out all of that equipment in these old nursery rooms. So here you can get a kind of see a better picture of those pits that were underneath the calves, right? So we removed all the gating, all the slatted floors, um, and we're just left with with concrete floor and those little concrete lagoons um, in this picture, same ventilation system, of course. This was our choice. Our choice was to go with the Caftel pens, individual housing right now. These pens are capable of pairing or grouping if, if we would decide to, um, but we were able to fit. Uh, two rows of 44 calves right drive by feeding uh, and these calves are housed. Here in this picture, you can see from the back, right? So we filled in all of these pits with gravel. So there's still the built in built in manure drain system underneath all of this gravel. Uh, so any of the liquids that are able to, to get down to the gravel can soak through and actually go down and exit the building um, through through our manure handling system. Um, and then calves again, just very standard indoor calf tail pens. Uh, you know, water, milk on one side, starter grain on the other. We 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 chose to do four by seven foot pens, uh, which twenty eight square feet per calf. We also chose to go with the Air Max backs uh, to allow hopefully better better air passage through those calf micro environments. And and we did choose to go with solid side panels. Uh, if we were going to have calves that that had nose to nose contact. We wanted to be able to control when that would happen. Um, and, and this is the direction that we that we decided to go. Our delivery system was well, just kind of what I priced out in that previous quote. So we decided to go with with uh, a Kubota, for example, here with a with a. I believe it's a 140 gallon delivery tank on the back uh, pump. Um, to to dispense milk to all of our calves, right? And this allows us to do drive by feeding uh, for our calves. Next, if this works, I have a video of the auto feeder or the delivery tank. Play it one more time. So that video is about 12 seconds in length. So, I mean, for this group of calves, for example, we're feeding each calf in about five seconds. So the delivery of milk, I think, is, is, is quite efficient. And this delivery system is capable of feeding, you know, however many calves you want it to feed. And, and it's also quite flexible for calving slugs, right? We're not confined by, let's say, 20 calves per nipple on an auto feeder. Um, we just, we set up more pens and we feed more calves when, when we have more to feed and less when we don't. Um, quite, quite dynamic system that allows us, I think, to, to manage our calves quite well. Outcomes, of course, right? We're how you know what did what did we achieve? Did did we achieve what we were setting out to achieve with our goal? I can say that I'm I'm very happy the direction that we're headed. We've we've reduced death loss by 75% in our nursery. Right now it was embarrassingly high before. Um, but but I I'm really happy the direction we've been able to go. Uh for for our calf calf ranch employees. It has also been very, very positive, right? The the compassion fatigue they were experiencing in the past 
um, this has truly opened their eyes to to what is possible and 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 them having having satisfaction and, and being being proud of the work that they do every day. Uh, they can see those results in, in our in our new retrofitted facility, which has been really encouraging. Um, drug costs, right? Cut in half, easy. Uh, just just less less disease, less sick calves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our weaning process has significantly improved. Now, granted, I'll be the first to admit where we came from was maybe the worst possible scenario, so it could only get better. Um, but but I'm I'm proud of the calves we're able to wean out of this facility. You know, watching you know how we you know we do a 14 day uh, weaning weaning uh, protocol as we drop them down in milk down to down to zero milk delivered uh, and watching how their starter grains on an individual calf basis actually go up uh, I, I, it has really really changed changed for the better for for all of our heifers and, and the, what we can do with them through the weaning process for the first time ever, we have old eight month old heifers that are now actually showing heat, right? I mean, the average daily gains of, uh, you know, from birth to, to eight, nine months is, is just incredible. I mean, nothing like nothing we were able to achieve in our old facility, of course. Uh, it's, it's been been a very gratifying experience. <clears throat> so the conclusion of my talk, and, and I hope that that each of you have found something worth the value of, of this presentation, but, but really both individual feeding and auto feeders can work. I do believe that, you know, I think every farm has to ask themselves, what's their goal? What do they want out of their wet calf program? And then what do you want to manage? If you want to manage auto feeders, you can make them work and you have can have excellent results. Um, but, whatever direction you go certainly you are going to have to decide what needs to be managed and what you are willing to manage and for us the the individual the simplicity of the individual housing um where, where i think we're gaining efficiencies uh what i think is a cost effective way of raising a replacement heifer um certainly pulled us the direction that we've decided to go um, by no means am I saying auto feeders are are evil and, and cannot work. They can. I've worked with clients when I was in practice that did a wonderful job with their auto feeders. Um, but I've also been to a lot of train wrecks, right? And, and I'm sure you you guys as veterinarians have as well. Um, and, and for us, we we didn't we did not want to manage auto feeders and in, in that type of environment for our milk fed calves. And with that, I will. Take any additional questions if there, if there are any. Yes, we have a few questions. How many fewer calves are in the rooms since the conversion? Yeah, a good question. So in our old nursery system, we had approximately 200 calves per room. In our new system, there's 88 calves per room. Great. Um, this one's a little bit longer. I haven't had a chance to read it all the way through, so hopefully I'll get it right here. Forsaking everything else, especially economics and animal productivity, where do you think animal welfare falls in the hierarchy of important considerations in facility design? In other words, if one facility was significantly cheaper or more convenient, but leads to one third more morbidity and one third more mortality, given the, cons the consumer in 2021, do you think we can consider those types of facilities? I'll stop there. There's another part to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's, um, how do I want to answer this? The right. I, I'm a veterinarian. I, I, I care deeply about the welfare of, of the animals uh, on our farms. Um, I want to be proud of how we raise animals, how we care for our animals. Um, I want to be able to give tours i want to be able to show other people what we're doing and and how we're doing it um i don't think it has to be a trade-off between welfare and cost i i think you can have those together of course it takes investment to raise calves um it will regardless but uh if you want to be proud of the work you're doing and, and the animals you're raising I, I don't think it has to be an either or. 
Okay, and it's uh, you kind of answered this in a roundabout way. Um, now, if you're wearing your producer manager hat, do you think differently um, rather than as a consulting veterinarian? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, right, so so I'm in a unique position here where where I'm both, right? So I'm in I'm in charge of the the, the finances of Elm Dairy specifically, and also play a, a meaningful role in, in 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 the finances and cost of our calf ranch and and the herd replacement costs that I eventually um, get here at the dairy. Um, but I still I still don't I still don't think it's an either or. I, I think they come hand in hand. I animals raised in a in a uh, a friendly you know positive welfare environment are productive animals. Again, for me, it's not an either or. Thank you. Are you planning to flush the gravel periodically under the calves since you are set up for it? Good question. Um, we will be starting this week actually on removing all of the gravel uh, and, and putting in concrete floors with, with dedicated drains under each pen. Um, we'll be starting that work uh, by the end of the week. Um, the gravel for us uh, has, has been, has been um, labor time consuming to manage. Um, and so, to be honest, we're not going to leave the gravel in long enough to find out. Eventually, it would have to, in my mind, it would have to be removed as it's going to get somewhat clogged with bedding. Um, but I think it would take quite some time for that to happen. Uh, and for us, we've, we've made the decision that we're going, going to invest in this facility long term. And, and, and therefore, we will, we will be concreting the, the entire surface in those, in those rooms. Are you still using or plan on using a supplemental heat? And if so, what type of heat? Forced air in the floor? That, that's a great question. Um, I have never met a dairy farmer that's willing to heat a milk fed calf barn appropriately, uh, meaning that they're willing to, to, to keep it warm enough, but exhaust that heated air um, in the winter time uh, to, keep, to keep air quality where it needs to be. Uh, so for that reason, I am I am personally opposed to heating calf barns because I don't think anyone's willing to actually do it correctly. Maybe there are some producers out there. I haven't met them yet. Uh, so no, these rooms will not be heated. Um, these will be individual calves on straw, calf jackets. Um, of course, it's a more tempered environment compared to being, a, let's say, in an outdoor hutch. Um, but but no, they will not be heated. Thank you. Um, at this point, I don't have any other questions, but a few comments. People are uh, thanking you for sharing your experience and for a great presentation. Um, I don't know if you have any last minute tidbits you want to add. Or I, I don't. I'd be happy to, to share my contact information if with anyone that has additional questions. If you want to get in touch with Nicole, the moderator, she is more than welcome to pass on my contact information. And um, and it's been a pleasure. I've, I've appreciated the opportunity. Thank you very much. Oh, I had one last question come in. Yeah. Um, if, if you hadn't had an existing structure to start with, what would you do differently from with a scratch building? Yes. Let me go back in my presentation if you're still able to see it. I would have built I would have built this structure on the bottom left, this white south-facing monoslope barn, um, curtain sides, uh, positive pressure tubes or ceiling fans or some other type of, of ventilation system to get into the calf environment. Uh, that middle picture with the sloped floor and the drains. Um, I, I my personal opinion, if 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 you do not want to do an outdoor hutch, my personal opinion, this is the direction I would have went. Um, and th these are the facilities that we had, um, you know, uh, priced out on paper, um, engineered, 
Um, so, so we actually, we ended up buying the 15 acres of land. Uh, so we, we are now owners of that 15 acre parcel um, next to our calf ranch. We went through all of the engineering, all of the bidding process um, to build these new structures. Um, so we were actually moments away from pulling the trigger and spending that three and a half million dollars. Um, until there were there were a variety of things that happened on our dairy that that caused us to to change course. Um, but to answer the question, these this type of facility is what I would have built. Great, thank you. Um, there are no other questions at this point. So again, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Michaels. Uh, appreciate it. All your knowledge and experience with going through this process. Uh, it's great insight for other individuals. And I want to thank our members for joining us today, taking time and spending it with us. So everybody uh, stay safe and stay cool if possible. Have a great week. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you.